Virginia, you will find a homer side at speed 43 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. I'm sorry, sir, I can't understand you. What is the address? He was unfortunately born on March 9, 1945, as one of the four sons of William and Dorothea Raider. He was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas, but grew up in Wichita, where he will be responsible for the bloody series decades later. He was never a big fan of schooling. <laughs> well, there's the first mistake, because he was caught in the most stupid way imaginable. You would consider that a guy who invaded the law enforcement for so long would have been a hell of a lot smarter than this dumb scumbag. Anyway, he decided to leave college and join the US Air Force because he dreamed of becoming a pilot. However, he spent the next four years working as a mechanic. When he returned to Kansas, he finally managed to graduate, while in the meantime he made a living doing various jobs, from working in the market to installing security devices in homes. One of the biggest ironies about his occupation is the fact that he installed security devices and cameras for people who wanted to protect themselves from monsters like himself. On the outside, he seemed like a perfectly normal, ordinary man from the neighborhood, but what was hidden deep inside him would not be known until years later. He started to develop his sexual fantasies in his teenage days and he hid it well from everyone. He tore pages from women magazines and then drew ropes around heads and wrists. He stole women's underwear that he would often wear himself. Dennis Rader was both a sadist and a masochist because he liked to inflict pain on himself as much as he inflicted on others. Now this part right here I find extremely disturbing. Some of you who watched Mindhunter on Netflix are familiar with the fact that he liked to strangle himself, bury himself tie his hands with a cord and put a plastic bag over his head. The actor's portrayal in Mindhunter was scary, however, just the looking at the images that he took, it is probably enough to give you nightmares for weeks. this shit. What causes a person to express in such twisted way? I'm trying to comprehend in my head how his brain actually worked, but to be honest I'm struggling because he had zero problems in childhood apart from the alleged neglect by his mother and he was by all accounts just a normal guy next door. But again, aren't they all? He enjoyed watching the beheading of chickens and actually practiced tying on cats a few times. Although this was bad enough by itself, it turns out that it was just not enough for him. While in the Air Force, Raider visited prostitutes so he could fulfill his deviant sexual fantasies. But as it would later turn out, even they didn't have the freedom to participate in his bizarre demands. Can you imagine what this psychopath actually asked for? That even a person whose only income was from selling their own body rejected him. He told the family that it was just a robbery and that nothing would happen to them if they followed his instructions. But 
he tied their hands and then killed one member at a time, either by strangulation with a rope or a plastic bag over their head. At some point, he even let the victims catch their breath and regain consciousness for a short time, just so he could start over. I mean, it takes a huge amount of brain damage to be able to execute something like that, for your own deviant pleasure. To make matters worse, he would literally pull out his Johnson and play, while the victims were suffering just a few feet away from him. After the crime, the police were shocked that all this happened in broad daylight, and that on top of that the killer didn't leave any traces which led them to believe that this scenario had been planned for a very long time. Since the evidence found didn't initially indicate a serial killer, the police suspected that the Mafia may have targeted the Otero family for reasons unknown at the time. Finally, after they established that the family had no criminal connection and examined the crime scene in detail, they found traces of semen. The police chief revealed to the media that it was most likely a murderer who had some disturbing fetish. Now I'm not getting this part quite exactly because the first DNA testing, if I'm not mistaken, took place in 1986, so 12 years after this crime, so I don't completely understand why they didn't test it then. Only 3 months later, Raider attacked again. This time he sneaked into the house of Catherine Bright and waited for her to return home. However, he didn't expect her to show up with her brother, Kevin. He used the gun to convince the victims again that it was just a robbery and that he only wanted money and car keys. The problem occurred the moment he set out to strangle Kevin with a rope and when Kevin actually realized it wasn't just a robbery after all. He managed to fight back somehow until Raider pulled out the gun and shot him twice. After Dennis left the room for a short time, Kevin managed to get out, where two people met him on the street and immediately took him to the hospital. After the call, the police quickly arrived at a crime scene and found Catherine still alive, despite multiple stab wounds to the abdomen and wounds to the neck from the rope. Unfortunately, she passed away just a few hours later. The police didn't link the case to the Otera family at the time. And although Kevin gave a full description of Raider, nothing more could be done. After that, the whole situation calmed down for a couple of years. This part was chilling, because unlike others, he was actually in control. He could lay low for a couple of years if needed, and that is exactly why the police had so few things on him. However, as the famous saying goes, at least in my country, the devil doesn't give rest. So Dennis, in pause, between murders, sent letters to the police, often with questions about why his murders aren't mentioned more in the media. He also wanted to be known that all credit for the crime must go directly to him as a solo player. This is especially disgusting fact because this comeback was not only exploiting his narcissistic traits but was also a very miserable individual whose main goal was just the wish to be accepted in the famous company. When you actually think about it, he didn't commit a crime only for his pleasures, but also because of a desperate need for attention. Sick. In one of those letters, where he often described in detail to confirm the authenticity, Raider wanted to leave his recognizable nickname. You now understand how pathetic this guy actually was. He was so neglected that even scavengers like media didn't give him a nickname like they usually do. <laughs> Poor little Dennis. He often wrote letters with grammar errors to deceive the police that he was an educated killer, but based on other content in the letter, the police concluded that at one point he was also studying criminal psychology. After five murders in the period from 1974 to 1977, BDK was not on the map. That is, until he committed two more murders that year. The victims were Shirley Vianne and Nancy Fox. Shirley's murder was according to the pattern, and BDK even locked her three children in a closet, and he even intended to kill them later, but he didn't have the time. He reported the murder of Nancy Fox himself to the police, because her murder was different, and he was actually afraid that police would not associate his name 
with that crime. <laughs> this guy was just something else. In January of the following year, he continued to send letters to the media and in one he sent to a local station, he was visibly frustrated that his name didn't appear on national television. The letter was short and distinctly clear. How many more people do I need to kill to have my name in the newspaper? At the end of 1979, Raider stopped sending letters and the dark lasted for about 8 years. In that period, before the final murders, the person named Anna Williams can be considered one of the luckiest people in the world because one accidental stay at work for overtime eventually saved her life. BDK snuck into her house and waited for her to return. When he saw that she wouldn't come, after all, he went and took her scarf, after which he sent it back with a message. Be happy that you were not here, because I was. After two years, the team formed to work on this case was disbanded. Without new clues and new information, the case has almost cooled down and the detectives have been transferred to other cases. Many thought that, that was it. It was over. They would never know who was responsible for the monstrosities. Since he was a classic psychopath, where it was virtually impossible to control his murderous instincts, as many assumed, many thought he was either dead or in prison, but he was still very much out there. In fact, he was a prominent member of the commune and influential member of a Christian church. In 1987, the police found out the bitter truth. BDK was not dead, nor in prison. After the triple murder of the Fager family took place, Raider sent a letter to the police claiming that it was not his work. As it will turn out later, Raider was not so inactive, considering the fact that he killed two more people, including his neighbor Marine Hatch in 85 and Vicky Vergali in 86. In count eight, it is claimed that on or about the 27th day of April 1985 to the 28th day of April 1985, in Sedgwick County, Kansas, it is claimed that you unlawfully killed a human being, Marine Hedge, maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation, inflicting injuries from which Marine Hedge did die on April 27, 1985. Can you tell me what occurred on that day? Well, actually, uh, kind of like the others, uh, she was chosen. Uh, I went through the different phases. Uh, stocking phase, and since she lived down the street from me, I could watch the coming and going quite easily. Uh, on that particular day, I, uh, I uh, had a, a, a other commitment. I came back from that commitment, parked my car over at uh, Woodlawn and 21st Street uh, at Bowling Alley there at that time. Uh, before that, I dressed until I had some other clothes on, I changed clothes, I went to the bowling alley, uh, went in there, uh, the pretense of bowling, called a taxi, had a taxi take me out to Park City, uh, I had my kit with me as a bowling bag. All right, that was Park City in Sedgwick County, yes, Kansas? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. All right, you had the taxi take you to Park City, what happened then? Uh, there I asked, I, I uh, pretended that I was a little uh, drunk, I just took I just took some beer and forced it around my mouth. and. The guy could probably smell the alcohol on me. I asked, told him to let me out so I could get some fresh air, and I walked from where the taxi let me off over to her house. All right, where does she live? Uh, 62, <laughs> 42, 54, 62, 54, 62, 54, North Independence. All right, when you walked over there, what happened next? Well, as before, I was going to have uh, sexual fantasy, so I brought my hit kit, uh, and uh, lo and behold, her car was there. I thought, gee, she's not supposed to be home. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar, and after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled, so uh, it 
went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. Uh, she came in with a male visitor. They were there for maybe an hour or so. Uh, he left. I waited till wee hours in the morning uh, and then proceeded to uh, sneak into her bedroom and uh, flip the lights on real quick like, or I think the bathroom lights. I just I didn't want to flip her lights on. And, and she screamed, and I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. All right. Now, were you wearing any kind of disguise or mask at this time? No, no. You indicated this woman lived down the street from you. Did she know you? Uh, casually, we'd uh, walk by and wave. Uh, she she liked to work in her yard as well as I like to work. It's just a neighborly type thing. It wasn't anything personal. I mean, just a neighbor. All right, so she was in her bed when you turned on the lights in the bathroom? Yeah, the bathroom, yeah, the, the, so I could get some light in there. All right, what did you do then? Oh, I manually strangled her when she started to scream. So you but, used your hands? Yes, sir. And you strangled her? Did she die? Yes. All right, what did you do then? Uh, after that, uh, since I was in the uh, sexual fantasy, I uh, went ahead and uh, stripped her and uh, probably went ahead and uh, I'm not sure if I tied her up at that point in time. But anyway, uh, she was nude, and I put her on a blanket, uh, went through her purse, some personal items in the house, and I figured out how I was going to get her out of there. Uh, eventually uh, moved her to the trunk of the car. <sighs> Took the car over to uh, Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, this is with the older church. And uh, I took some pictures of her. Uh, again, Vicki was uh, regularly was another potential victim. I went through those different phases, uh, locked in on her, as I would call it, and uh, decided that I would try that date. I used a ruse as a uh, telephone repairman to get in their house. Uh, drove there in my own personal car uh, around lunchtime, during lunch hour, or approximately that time. It was earlier in the morning than that. And, uh, but my, I actually went somewhere else and changed uh, changed my clothes, what I, what I call my uh, hit clothes. And, hit uh, clothes? Hit clothes. Uh, basically different, you know, things that I'd need to get rid of later. Not, not the same kind of clothes that I had on. I, I don't know what other better word to use it, uh, crime clothes or hit clothes. I just call them hit clothes. Uh, anyway, I walked from my car as a telephone uh, repairman. As I walked there, I donned the telephone helmet. I had a briefcase. Went to one other address just to kind of size up the house. I'd walked by it a couple times, but I wanted to check it a little bit more. Uh, as I approached it, I could hear a piano sound. And uh, went to this other door, knocked on him, and told him I was, that we were recently working on telephone repairs in the area. And, uh, and went, to her, went to her and knocked on the door and asked her if I could come check her telephone lines inside. Did she allow you in? Yes, she did. What happened then? I uh, went over and uh, found out where the telephone was, uh, simulated that I was checking the uh, telephone. I had a make-believe instrument, and uh, after she was looking away, I, I drew a pistol at her and asked her if she'd go back to the bedroom with me. Was this the same 357 Magnum you used? No, this, this was a different one. Different pistol. Are you asked her to go back to the bedroom with you after drawing a pistol on her? Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, I told her, we went back to the bedroom, I told her I was going to have to tie her up. Uh, she was very upset, and I think we I used some material that was in, uh, and that, that's another thing, I'm not sure, but I, I think I used the material that they had in their bedroom, and after I tied her hands, uh, she broke that and we started fighting, and we fought quite a bit, back and forth. All right, she was physically fighting you? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Uh, finally got the hand on her and got a, a, a nylon sock and started strangling her. You wrapped the stocking around her neck? Yes. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Uh, I finally gained, uh, gained on her and, and, and put her down, and I thought she was dead, but apparently she wasn't. But uh, after, after she was down and not moving anymore, I, I rearranged her clothes a little bit and took some quick photos, I think three of them, if I remember. And then uh, after that, I, there was a lot of commotion. Uh, she had mentioned something about her husband coming home. So I got out of there pretty quick. The dogs were raising a lot of cane in the back. Uh, the doors and the windows were all open to the house. There was a lot of noise when we were fighting. So I left pretty quickly after that. Put everything in the briefcase. and had her. I'd already gone through her uh, purse and got the keys to the car and used her car for my getaway car.
All right, now you indicate that you thought that she was dead. Did you discover later that she was not dead? Yes, I guess the paramedics uh, arrived and they tried to attempt to re relieve her, or revive her, and that, that failed. I don't know if she died there or on the way to the hospital or at the hospital. I don't recollect. But you later found out that she did die as a result of your strangulation? Yes. The final victim came in 91, when he killed a 62-year-old Dolores Davis. He tied her up, took a couple of photos and threw her body under the bridge. After the final murder, there was no sign or voice from Dennis Rader for the next 14 years. Now imagine this situation, you are living in a normal community, a happy suburb maybe. You are a prominent member of the local church and people like you. You appear just like a random, normal guy in the public. A good husband, a loving father, go to weddings, happy family, fishing trips. But in reality, you like to occasionally bury yourself, put on sickening masks and hang yourself from the trees. And you in fact killed 10 people. Many wonder how in the world his family didn't suspect a thing, but that's how his psycho mind actually was. That is until his huge desire for attention cost him dearly. This is Cake News on your side. Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. A letter sent to the Wichita Eagle is now believed to be from the BTK killer. It's a story that broke first on cake late this afternoon. Now, the BTK killer hasn't been heard from in decades, but now it appears he may be back. Many believe that the trigger for his move was an article that was published in the newspaper, and it concerned the Otera family and how practically no one remembers the name BTK anymore. He started sending letters again, and at one point he asked, listen to this now, can the police track down the floppy disk, and if it was safe for him to include it in the next letter? <laughs> what do you think the police said? And this dumb prick actually believed them. The police managed to recover the metadata files that eventually led to the mansion church. After a long 30 years, investigators finally had a name. Dennis Rader was arrested on February 25, 2005. According to police reports, Rader was more shocked by the fact that the police lied to him than that he was caught. The trial went pretty smoothly given the fact that this psychopath described his murders in much detail and with great deal of satisfaction, judge and the jury had rather an easy decision. A friendly neighbor was sent behind the bars forever. 